Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. It is Monday, December 20th, uh, just past the hour of two. And this is our weekly Westchester County update touching on COVID and other related issues. Uh, as you can see, I am still under house isolation uh, because of my positive test of COVID. This will be the last day of that isolation. But um, as, we, uh, as we go forward through this, I'll be joined by Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins, who is also uh, going through his positive uh, COVID test isolation. Uh, we join 152,000 other Westchester residents who at some point in time during the context of this uh, pandemic have tested positive for COVID. Ken and I are just two of the ones recently. And we have seen now in the last few days an absolute explosion in the number of positive cases. Uh, for the record, as of yesterday's numbers, I said 152,000. It's actually now 157,296 people, pandemic to date, that have uh, tested positive for COVID at some point in time. Some may be individuals who have tested positive twice on two separate occasions. We have 7,462 active cases. That means 7,461 of our fellow residents, my being one of them, uh, are, are uh, yet to uh, complete the 10 or 14 day period of uh, isolation due to COVID. That number, 7,462, has jumped up dramatically. A week ago today, on Monday, the 13th of December, we had 4,868 individuals. That has jumped up by a 50% increase from 4,800 all the way up to 7,400, slightly more than, than a, an increase of 50%. Uh, our numbers on, sat on Sunday, 983 people tested positive for COVID. On Saturday, 904 people tested positive for COVID. On Friday, 980 plus tested positive, 730 on Thursday. So these numbers have been increasing. And the number of testing that has gone on uh, has shown us that even though we're in the teens in thousands of tests, 13,000 tests yesterday, 14,000 tests the day before, our infection rate has jumped up dramatically. A week ago, our infection rate was 4.8% for that particular day. Yesterday, the infection rate was 7.2%. 7.2% of all the people that took a COVID test uh, that was tracked in the, in the uh, state system uh, tested positive for COVID. And those numbers are consistent with what's happening in New York City, on Long Island, and throughout upstate New York, and no doubt in other parts uh, of our country. This surge we have not seen in a year. And uh, this, this increase in the number of different cases has also generated a tremendous demand to be tested uh, for COVID. <clears throat> We've had over the last uh, week or so, 75,000 individuals tested for COVID within the uh, official tracking system. That does not include the number of people that have tested with home uh, test kits. And the demand has really uh, just exploded. We've seen it with long lines in front of many urgent care centers and other places where testing has gone on over the weekend. Uh, and, and it's really a, uh, a confluence of a number of major issues happening at the same time. We have, first of all, the cold weather that is uh, aiding in the increase of the number of cases. And then also the holiday season, both Thanksgiving, uh, Halloween and Hanukkah in the rearview mirror, Christmas coming up along with Kwanzaa and the New Year uh, just ahead of us. And it's causing more people in more social context, holiday parties and so forth to be exposed to the virus. Uh, the Omicron uh, strain or variant, if you will, has been proven to be very contagious. And while people may think they know where they got the disease from, uh, it, is, it is in so many different venues and places that uh, people's exposure is uh, almost universal in the number of uh, situations where people have come down with COVID. And uh, prior vaccination, double vaccination and boostering has not been an automatic uh, resistant factor to getting uh, infected. There are many cases of individuals who've been double vaxxed and boosted and still receive the, uh, the the infection. What we do believe the infections are showing us is, uh, and the vaccinations are showing us, is that while infected individuals are much less seriously affected by COVID, and they're much less likely to be hospitalized, much less likely to die. During my own uh, one week period of time, 10 day period of time, uh, I, have, I have exhibited no serious symptoms, did not run a fever at any point in time during this week, uh, was not bedridden, did not have uh, problems breathing. Um, the symptoms were very mild. In a few minutes, Ken Jenkins will talk and he can uh, share what his stories are. There are other individuals out there, some of whom have chosen uh, to release their details. Uh, it is important to understand when we give general statistics, we are being very careful about what we can and can't say. 
federal HIPAA laws prohibit any individual from revealing any other individual's uh, COVID status. And to do that is a breach of their privacy uh, and uh, inappropriate, uh, illegal. So we must be very careful about what we say and how we say it. Um, importantly, however, the number of um, hospitalizations, so that you have a statistic, has reached, uh, as of Saturday, 134 individuals hospitalized. That is up from a week ago where we had 119, and about a month ago, we were in the 20s and 30s. So there's clearly been a jump in hospitalization. However, given the astronomically high number of infections, uh, we're you know, rather hopeful that the number of hospitalizations are as low as 134 uh, we might have thought that they'd have been double that by now, and so we're, we're cautiously optimistic. We have lost 2,370 individuals to COVID uh, over the last week. That represents uh, a loss uh, of about seven individuals. That's a higher number of loss than we've seen in prior weeks, but it is still uh, a number that's well below where we were at other peak periods when the, uh, when the infection really began in the spring of 2020. And then again, a year ago, when we saw high numbers were exactly at this time of the year, in December into January. Every fatality is a tragedy, not to be uh, trivialized by being a statistic, uh, but in losing six, seven people over the last week, we recognize that um, we have less fatality and less hospitalization from this current bout of COVID. But that does not mean that a person cannot die or cannot be seriously sick. It is the vaccination element that we believe is the difference. And the best proof of it is to look at those statistics. <laughs> Roughly a year ago, we had lost 1,500 people, 1,600 people to COVID in the first 10 months of the infection. Uh, that was a fatality rate of 2.1% of everybody who contracted the disease on a basis of 84,000 people. Uh, over the last few months, we've uh, had about 70,000 people contract the disease, last 10, 11 months, and we have had uh, the loss of about uh, 560 people, much lower than what we lost a year ago, much smaller fatality rate, under 1%, 0.8%. A tenths of a percent. So uh, clearly the, the fatality figures have dropped dramatically with uh, the institution of vaccinations. And of course, vaccinations come in, in different measures now. We're looking at the vaccination numbers that tell us at this stage of the game that here in Westchester County, over 94 percent of our 18 years of age and older population has at least one vaccination dose and 83 percent of the people have been fully vaccinated. Now, fully vaccinated, meaning two doses, that does not include the booster shot, and the booster shot percentages are rising, but they do not yet reach the 80 percentile mark. Uh, it took us a long period of time to get people to the first and second dose of vaccinations. Even with two doses, uh, the, the sensitivity that the individual has to getting the disease is one thing, but the severity of the disease appears to be something quite different. So we're encouraged that we're now over 700,000 people that have received uh, double vaccination here in Westchester County and booster shots are available for those 18 years of age and older. And we've also uh, been well underway in pediatric uh, medical uh, vaccination numbers as well. Um, the, we do not have a, a universal number for pediatric vaccinations, those under the age of 12 that were made legal a little more than a month ago. The two largest areas of concentration for vaccinations is Westchester Medical Center, uh, and also our various county health departments, satellite vaccination locations at various schools. And we've been doing them uh, in schools all throughout Westchester County uh, for young people from Peekskill to uh, southern part of the county in New Rochelle, first and second doses. In the aggregate, we show that 4,300 young people have received vaccination doses through either the medical center or our satellite clinics. <coughs> we have more of them coming up over the course of the next a uh, few weeks, and Ken is going to cover those in a couple of minutes. But uh, we are still dealing with this explosion of active cases coming just before the holiday season, and uh, that rate is going faster each day, which makes it even more important for us to to follow basic principles to try to protect ourselves from COVID. Um, the, the major issue over the weekend has been the long lines faced by those that wanted COVID testing. The Westchester County Health Department has devoted its attention toward vaccinations. We're vaccinating booster shots at the Westchester County Center, and we're vaccinating, as I've just mentioned, um, the uh, pediatric vaccinations at various school clinics, which we're doing six days a week uh, in, in local settings. So the central uh, COVID testing that the county was involved in with the state at Glen Island and some other locations 
has not been the case. We have relied on urgent care centers, medical practices to do the testing. However, because of the high demand for testing, because we deal with uh, a loss of healthcare personnel in many of those centers, they, they have less people to work with in their employment base, and also because those urgent care centers are not sized for mass testing. Uh, you know, a, a county center or drive through at the Glen Island environment does provide that, uh, but the smaller urgent care centers do not. And what we've seen over the weekend is long lines at these centers. People have to wait two and three hours or more waiting to get in and get a test. Part of it is insufficient number of tests available, test kits available to those urgent care centers. Those are provided directly by the state to those facilities. The county is not involved in that direct process. However, we have uh, gone to the state as of Friday and offered back the county center and Glen Island as sites for mass testing. It may only be a short-term need. It may not be a long-term need, depending on the demand for the season, travel in the season. Uh, but the state is taking that under advisement. We are prepared to uh, uh, continue to do vaccinations at the county center in part of the county center and still have part of the county center available to do testing, which we think would relieve some of the burden that we're seeing out there. The county's responsibility for testing really pivots around helping those who are indigent be able to receive tests. If you have uh, resources, you know, and there's a cost involved in the testing process, you bear that cost. Your medical insurance may cover that for you. But for poor individuals, individuals that may be on Medicaid or have no coverage at all, uh, we have worked through the various federally qualified health centers to try to provide test kits to those facilities so that they can do the testing. And that would be the Mount Vernon Health Center, Greenberg Health Center, Open Door in its various iterations, uh, the Hudson River Healthcare Center up in Peekskill, <coughs> all of those different uh, locations that would be able to uh, be helpful uh, in getting the testing done. The relief of the pressure is still going to take getting through the next few days because almost everybody that wants to travel for uh, the holidays, almost everybody that is going to somebody's house and they have required you to show a recent test within the last 48 hours that you're negative. Uh, everyone that um, uh, has people coming over to their house and they want to be sure that they're healthy and safe. Uh, that has put a tremendous strain on the testing process. It is true in Westchester. It is true on Long Island. It is true throughout the Hudson Valley. It is true in New York City. Now, many times we get compared to New York City because we're right next door to New York City. New York City, however, is a completely different kind of government structure. They are 10 times the size that we are. Their health department is far larger than any municipal health department anywhere in the state, bigger than Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester, perhaps combined because of their size and scope. They are a state-like sized government, and they have allocations that come directly from the federal government to them, uh, whereas we have to turn to the state government to have allocations, uh, whether it's testing or vaccines and that. And of course, New York City runs a series of hospitals, the Health and Hospitals Corporation. So they have staff above and beyond the healthcare department that can uh, be used to uh, either do testing or vaccination. And uh, so when my friends say, uh, you know, I can get this in New York City, how come I can't get it in Westchester? Because Westchester isn't sized or structured the way New York City is. New York City is, a, is an extremely unique government. I think we all understand that. In, in, uh, uh, in the United States of America, given its size and scope and complexity. However, we are working with the state, again, to establish uh, testing facilities uh, that, that we can use to help deal with this backlog and pressure for testing. Uh, we're getting additional kits to the neighborhood health centers so that they can test those people in that setting. Uh, and we're trying to be helpful as we can uh, with vaccinations uh, throughout the course of uh, uh, both pediatric vaccination and booster shot vaccinations. We recognize that people who are concerned are having difficulty, where do I go? We try to provide some information on our uh, website, westchestergov.com, but it's hard to keep it updated in real time. And we've seen situations where a, a center had available uh, test, uh, testing appointments, and then in the space of literally minutes, all of, those, um, uh, all of those situations have been gobbled up. So we have to work through this and do the best that we can. Um, the the um, state government, under the direction of Governor Kathy Hochul, issued a mask mandate a week ago, and in it, uh, it was required that uh, people in New York State wear masks indoors. We've had a lot of sturm and drang over how is it going to be enforced. A number of counties saying that they won't enforce it, don't believe in it philosophically. Um, you know, our position is is that a duly uh, established mandate by a superior government we treat as having the force of law. How we go about implementing it is within our discretion because uh, it is a difficult mandate to, uh, to maintain. And for those people 
who are vaccinated and are very adamant that other people wear masks and be vaccinated. We have a, we have a, a number of people who feel the exact opposite. They are aggressively unvaccinated, unmasked, and uh, do not choose to do anything unless it's uh, at a point of um, physical force, which um, we want to avoid having that kind of confrontation in this society right now with us divided already as it is with philosophical camps. We are implementing the mask mandate, <clears throat> first of all, by using half a million masks, which are in our possession, 500,000 masks uh, in Westchester County possession. And we are now distributing them to uh, retail businesses, to uh, not-for-profit organizations, to religious institutions, and also to uh, local governments. Uh, that process is starting underway. We're making them available, uh, information today. We have a municipal call coming up uh, right after this update is over uh, to the local governments. And we've reached out in the process of reaching out to small businesses and the, and the like to make masks easily available in every public contact area that's appropriate. And then separate and distinct from that to provide information that uh, codifies what the, um, uh, what the mandate is from the state uh, government, uh, from the governor. Uh, the mandate expires January 15th. She reserves the right to extend it if she chooses to do it. It is not a county mandate. It is a state mandate. And uh, that mandate can be enforced um, by our discretion. And we want to enforce it for compliance, not for punishment. We're not looking for confrontation. We're looking for people to put a mask on to reduce the amount of spread. This is such a highly contagious variant now, even with a mask on, even with vaccinations, you cannot be sure that it won't spread. And uh, while people are confident that they got their disease from a specific setting, no one really knows where these things happen uh, and exactly how they happen. Uh, it could be from anything. It could be from a surface you touched. It could be from proximity to somebody. It could be something that's in the air. The person has left the immediate area. You happen to be in the area and the virus load is still available. So without knowing that, uh, we don't think it makes a lot of sense to play Sherlock Holmes. It's more important to try to treat it as it arrives. Uh, and as when it happened to me, uh, it, it happened. I didn't worry about how I got it. I knew that I got it. And once I was made aware of it, I did what was necessary. And uh, we've tried to follow that pattern as we go forward. And masks are part of that pattern. We're working closely with the Board of Legislators, the County Board of Legislators, individual legislators will be involved in mass distribution in their area. We've done this before. This is nothing new. Uh, but we want to redouble our efforts in this regard to try to keep people as safe as possible and uh, get them, as I said, to retail merchants, local municipalities, churches, houses of worship, not-for-profits, and, and so forth. And then also to get out that information uh, that we can get out about the mandate so it can be posted in a public way. We want as much as is plausible to go virtual. Um, I've made the decision that uh, my inauguration, Ken Jenkins will also be sworn into office at the time, will not be the public setting that uh, you might expect I can tell you from having run for office before the inauguration <coughs> is, is a really um, uh, welcomed celebration of something you've accomplished by going through an electoral process. It usually is a year in duration and you go through the ups and downs of the campaign and that inauguration gives you some sense of uh, accomplishment with your friends. Um, and we're not going to do anything like a celebration this year. We will be doing it virtually uh, in this setting uh, in uh, two weeks. Um, and we'll take the oath of office. There'll be no in-room studio. It'll be broadcast in this fashion, so you'll be able to see it. We'll each have our chance to make inaugural remarks, but uh, we will forego uh, what pomp and circumstance may be involved in an inauguration uh, because we're trying to protect the health and welfare of the people around us. And I would encourage you to make sure that everybody else in your world does the same thing. There are many events and activities that have started to move into the virtual world, we have had um, settings with um, uh, various organizations. Uh, I saw a large amount Rotary Club move to a Zoom. Uh, a Kwanzaa group in Yonkers moved to a Zoom event. Um, a number of civic organizations have done the same thing. In so doing, we're reducing the uh, potential for infection. It's not eliminating it, but it's reducing the potential for it. And we encourage you in your personal activities and in your various um, organization efforts. Uh, do what you can to avoid the in-person potential for spread. Now, we know this is the holiday season. It, it's uh, a season of joy. Uh, may not feel that way right now. It's dark. It's cold. But um, uh, we have to be uh, smart. And, and what does it profit us to uh, have a celebration that turns into a super spreader 
and then people might be, yet become sick from this process. So we are also instructing all of our county boards and commissions that they will be in virtual mode from this point forward through January 31st. So any of the meetings in the month of January, all will be on WebEx uh, platform. It still allows people in the, in the public to be able to look in and see what those boards and commissions are doing, and they can participate in a fashion uh, to ask questions as they might were they to be in person. But we think it's just uh, smart thinking to move to the virtual world. Uh, so we're doing it with our boards and commissions. We're doing it with our uh, inaugural event, and we'll probably be doing it with more things along those lines. Next, I'm going to turn to Ken Jenkins, our deputy county executive, also going through the same cruise that I am. Uh, and uh, he's going to go over where we have satellite testing sites coming up over the course of the next week or two. And then also to share some of his experiences uh, in going through all of this. Ken Jenkins. Hey, um, thanks, George. Really appreciate that. Uh, um, first, you, you look great and sound great over um, the, the video. Um, you know, I still got a little bit of cough. For, for me, last week, um, I tested positive on Thursday. I had some mild symptoms, a little bit of a cough. Um, definitely had some chills and, and body aches going on. Um, didn't have a fever. Um, so, again, between being double vaccinated and I had a booster in, in October, um, as, as you know, the county executive was just pointing out, it is one of those things that, uh, again, vaccinations are meant to reduce the, the, the severe hospitalizations and fatalities. And um, you know, going through this particular process right now, I feel fine. Um, you know, I just have to have people uh, making sure that I don't, um, as George would say, uh, break out of the, the, the compound um, to make sure that we're keeping everyone safe and secure. Um, I get out of uh, um, isolation on the 26th. So I will um, definitely continue to do the things that we were doing as far as making sure the mask up. Um, and be as safe as possible and keeping distance, whether inside uh, the office building, um, around the folks in public places, um, making sure them to, to mask up and um, to keep our hands clean and sanitized, et cetera. But for me, uh, again, short of the initial mild, mild symptoms that I had last week on Wednesday um, and Thursday, um, I feel great. But again, we, we're all working through this together and um, going backwards and trying to identify, um, as, as George was saying, playing Sherlock Holmes, there, there is no way of doing that. And as we've seen the, the tremendous explosion in, in positive COVID cases around, it, it doesn't really um, matter. Um, having been double vaccinated and boosted, I will tell you um, that a lot of people were um, surprised. But again, the vaccinations work to make sure that we're not getting severely sick and, and um, increasing the strain on our healthcare system um, and making sure that we're trying to keep families safe and going from going forward. So make sure if you haven't got vaccinated to, to get vaccinated, if you're eligible for boosters, um, that, that folks for six months after your second, um, your second shot for Pfizer and Moderna or two months after a Johnson & Johnson um, shot, you can, get boosted and you should get boosted again. Um, very mild symptoms. Again, I felt like it was a cold. Um, and that's one of the other challenges. In the winter, we're all gonna have um, situations when the weather changes as quickly as it's been doing over the last two weeks going up and down. Um, feeling very um, nice 60 degree weather and then 40 degrees and 30 degree weather the next day. Um, we, we just have to continue to, to walk through and, and do everything possible to manage through this process and live um, and still do the things that we want to do um, as far as um, trying to keep our sanity and making sure to get around. But again, I feel fine. Um, and, and again, I know that because of the vaccinations and boosting um, that my symptoms are severely um, severely minor um, if I feel things at all. So I'm getting a great chance to be able to look at some different things and, and keep things going. And one of those is watching the, the satellite vaccination sites that we have going on. And we have two satellite vaccination sites that are gonna happen this week. One is with our, our partners and friends from the Austin Volunteer Ambulance Corps, um, shout out to them, um, that are going to be at the Sleepy Hollow Middle School today um, from 3.30 to 7.30 um, this afternoon. Um, and again, tomorrow, again, Sleepy Hollow Middle School from 3.30 to 7.30. Um, at, and that's in uh, Tarrytown, Sleepy Hollow. Um, again, the Austin Volunteer Ambulance Corps doing that particular one. And then um, tomorrow in New Rochelle at the Webster School, 
they're actually doing second doses at the Webster um, Webster School from 3.30 to 7. Um, again, so many people are out trying to make sure they get vaccinated or boosted um, as we go through this holiday season. Again, to be able to um, make sure that if um, you uh, encounter and, and get infected with the virus, that it's going to be mild, um, mild, mild symptoms and keeping people out from the hospital and making sure that we don't um, add to the fatalities um, for Westchester County. But again, for me, I feel fine. Thanks a lot for all the, the, the uh, well wishes that many people have been texting and calling and emailing. Um, really appreciate that. But again, we'll get through all of this together. And once again, vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. Thanks, George. Thanks, Ken. And um, we wish you as well uh, as, uh, good health. You know, it's, it's, it's a little frustrating, I'll just speak personally, and I'm sure Ken feels the same way. Ken and I have been out in the community throughout the course of the 22 months of this uh, pandemic. Many people worked from home uh, during this period of time. Ken and I and a few other key members of our team came into the county office building every day. We don't get any particular awards for that. That's our job. And our job is to show leadership and you lead by what you do as well. And the fact that we were able to be as active uh, you know, in the community as we were and avoid getting this disease for the longest time uh, that and uh, that, that really gave us a sense of confidence that we were managing things appropriately. This, uh, this explosion uh, hit us both and a lot of people without uh, significant symptoms in advance, no way to track, oh, I've got the disease. Um, and, uh, and then unfortunately, once you know, you can certainly uh, isolate, but you don't know until you know that uh, you needed to be tested. Ken and I both attended an event uh, a week ago Wednesday that turned out to be one where a number of people uh, came down with COVID, but that was not apparent to us until uh, a week ago this morning on Sunday, on Monday morning. So long story short, if it happens to me, it can happen to you. And uh, it may have already happened to you, depending on when you're watching it. So we're not immune to the same things that affect anybody else. And I would just ask you to uh, you know, be as careful as you can, but also understand this is a pandemic. This is not a joke. And uh, none of us can completely control what happens in and around us. And it's going to take a fair bit of forbearance and perseverance. Plans are going to be upset, plans that we care about deeply, but um, that is the nature of this. I said that almost the second week of this when I indicated it was going to take thoughtfulness, it was going to take self-discipline and perseverance, and it's going to take that and more as we work through each of these different situations. So just to recap what we have in the report today, um, we are getting uh, a, a stockpile of masks, half a million masks out into the community to various businesses, religious institutions, to governments uh, and uh, to try to get it to uh, not-for-profit organizations so that we can uh, respond to the need for people to wear masks uh, when they're indoors, put that out in the, in the hands of uh, organizations, businesses, and so forth. We are continuing our pediatric vaccinations with our county health staff, as mentioned, at the Sleepy Hollow Middle School and at the Webster Elementary School in New Rochelle this week. Uh, we're continuing to provide booster shots at the county center through uh, Westchester County Health Department auspices. We have offered up the remainder of the county center for additional testing. We've been able to uh, uh, receive, and we appreciate New York State providing us with 35,000 plus additional test kits that we can get to the local neighborhood health centers so that they can handle that. We've taken uh, our uh, executive branch boards and commission meetings and made them virtual. We've made the inauguration for the new year virtual. So to reduce the amount of uh, exposure, and uh, we're going to do everything else that we can think of to try to help uh, help do this. But we are still dealing with a pandemic that is uh, uh, has the ability to uh, outwit the smartest uh, medical and scientific brains in the country. So we as laymen will try to do the best we can to go through all of this. Uh, a week ago, I signed the county budget into law. That budget, I want to thank again the Board of Legislators under the leadership of Ben Boykin, the current chairman, uh, Mayor Jane Shimsky, the uh, Majority Leader, Marco Kunzio, the um, Minority Leader, and then the various whips and the Vice Chair, Alfreda Williams. Thanks to all of them for having the budget done on time. Uh, we now look forward to implementing that budget beginning the first of the new year, and we'll have many more things that, we're wor that we'll be working on. We're working on Memorial Field and a host of other capital projects, which will be the subject of upcoming um, uh, updates as we continue forward. We will be back again a week from today at uh, two o'clock. I hope to be in studio, Ken too. Uh, hopefully by then, those of you who celebrate Christmas will have had a very Merry Christmas. 
will be uh, beginning after Christmas, the Kwanzaa season uh, for our African-American brothers and sisters, <clears throat> and then leading up to uh, New Year's, which uh, may be celebrated in different ways, but at least it'll represent the turning of another page, uh, which we'll all be a part of. So uh, with that, uh, we have some press questions. I'm gonna to turn to Catherine Chaffee, our Director of Communications. Catherine, fire away. So the first one comes from Jack Seaman from the Hudson Independent. And he asks, have you learned anything more about COVID during the week that you were ill that you didn't know before? Uh, I learned that um, when I'm trapped like this, I feel like Tim Robbins in the Shawshank Redemption. I'm trying my best to cut a hole in the wall under the picture of Rita Hayworth so I can crawl down through the sewer pipes and get out of here. Um, look, I think, you know, the, uh, the isolation element of this means that you're not interacting with other people and you're reducing uh, any opportunity for you to infect other people. It is, uh, it's difficult for people to do this. Um, uh, I have uh, a more advantaged situation than, than many do. Uh, you can imagine a family of four or five people in a four room apartment. How do you isolate in a setting like that? Um, th there are lots of uh, difficult situations. I have a very uh, you know, modest environment, but it's still a private environment, a private residence. And so I do think about the people that have to deal with COVID that don't have some of those advantages. And I also think about the stress that, that uh, goes through everybody's minds. I'm, I'm a senior citizen. I think about uh, each night, you know, what happens if in the middle of the night I start to have trouble breathing and do I rush off to the hospital? And, and you know, could this be a moment of, uh, you know, serious illness and, and it hasn't happened, but you think about it because, you know, you have COVID and you know that some people it's reacted that way too. So, you know, I think Barrett, what happens is that, and I think I'm generally pretty thoughtful about these things. Um, I, I am concerned by the agitation I see out in the community, people that now are almost two full years off normalcy. They worry about their kids going to school. They worry about not being able to be with loved ones at the holidays. And they're much more agitated, much more anxious, looking for somebody to blame, irritated. And, and uh, wherever you are on the spectrum, if you're unvaccinated, you feel like you're being put upon. If you're vaccinated, you feel like you're being put upon. Uh, and I think some of that is, is a natural outgrowth of being sequestered in the way that we are uh, and knowing that what should normally be a joyous moment, Christmas caroling for those who can do that, uh, you know, uh, going out and shopping and seeing the pretty lights in the city and all of those things uh, are, have been done much less this year than in, and last year than in the years prior. So I think it is frustrating, but I also think that what, I, what you learn is that you can get through things. Uh, this uh, this is something that I'm getting through, and I think we can all get through it. That's what you learn is that we are resilient people, and we can get through this. The next question is from David. What else can the state do to relieve some of the testing pressure? I'm sorry, say that again. David Proper from the Journal News is asking, what yes. else can the state do to relieve some of the testing pressure? Well, I think I've indicated uh, what, this, what the paths are. It's how fast these things can be done. Number one, more test kits, which the state has agreed to provide. Um, number two, uh, try to get to venues that are larger so that as people wait for testing, they're not waiting outside if they might be sick and they're outside and they're feeling, you know, uh, stress from that. Uh, that's a negative and try to try to deal with that. Um, you know, there is a problem in having enough health care individuals. Uh, many healthcare individuals over the last two years have uh, retired from the healthcare business. It's been a lot of physical stress on nurses and doctors, uh, and they're down a number of uh, professionals. Uh, some, uh, you know, have had to deal with their own health because of exposure to this. Uh, that is outside of what the state or the, the county government can do. We did a call out for retired uh, physicians and and nurses when this first happened, and we got we got a good response. But now, two years after constant, you know, grinding of people's energy and time, it's becoming much more difficult. We have used non-healthcare professionals to help us with some of the vaccination clinics. So uh, people like Rosie Finizio and Victor Ariaga, uh, Bob Marone, who are not by profession medical people, help do some of the, uh, the management work uh, at these vaccination centers. But it still comes down to properly trained individuals, nurses and otherwise, to actually administer shots and put themselves in harm's way. And that is a missing link uh, that uh, I'm not sure how that gap gets closed. But for the urgent care centers that have been the, the bulk of where 
uh, testing has gone on. Uh, our efforts are trying to help them uh, in whatever way we can, but they don't report to us. We don't have control over them. We don't charter them. So uh, this, the ultimately, it's the state executive branch that has that authority and also that responsibility. We'll work with them to implement whatever strategies they develop. The next question is in regards to the timeline for the county center opening again for uh, boosters and for COVID testing. What is that timeline? Well, the boosters are within our control. It's our, st it's our staff that provides that vaccination level. Um, for testing, uh, the state would first of all have to agree to go forward with it. And then they would make an allocation of, of personnel that would help us get off the ground. And they would need a uh, healthcare partner to help administer the tests. Uh, as I said, our staff uh, is very professional, but it is somewhat limited. And we're already engaged now in the vaccination side of the equation. And there are other functions that the health department has over and above COVID. So, um, you know, uh, the state would need to um, you know, contract with a healthcare provider that has the resources to be able to help do the vaccinations. Uh, we had Westchester Medical Center with us in the vaccinations at the county center, and we had Northwell with us uh, for the testing at um, uh, Glen Island. <coughs> but the timeline is that we think, you know, we can uh, bring the county center online in really a matter of days uh, when given the green light and given the partnership. The state does have National Guard troops that they can deploy that will help us in some of the physical setup that would be needed. But again, we need medical professionals to do that, which is only uh, can be done by medical professionals. So, um, you know, that might be a day or two or three away. I'm not in a position to know the timeline. It's really up to, you know, how the state executive branch determines it. And keep in mind, just as, you know, I have to deal with 45 different municipalities. When I talk to a town supervisor, a village mayor, uh, I have at any one point in time, 20 village mayors and 19 town supervisors to deal with. Well, so does a governor have uh, 57 counties plus the city of New York to deal with. So it is not easy when you have an even greater challenge right now in Buffalo <clears throat> because of the, um, the overflow in hospitals uh, and the problem in the Southern tier. Uh, so, you know, each of us are competing for scarce resources at a statewide level. This is, this is a pandemic for a reason. It's not just limited to a, a localized incident. It's all of us all over that are having these problems. Okay, the next question comes from Martin Wilbur from the Examiner. He's asking, with the surge in cases, has there been any talk about stopping visits to hospitals and nursing homes? Well, hospitals and nursing homes are under the control of the state. Uh, there's been some discussion about uh, limiting uh, visits to um, nursing homes. I haven't heard the same apply to hospitals. Uh, at this stage of the game, the hospitals uh, are still managing their bed uh, inventories based on a variety of needs, not just COVID. I think you heard Susan Fox uh, when we did the last in-studio update, perhaps two weeks ago, who was the president and CEO of White Plains Hospital, talk about that process and how she's managing it for the White Plains Hospital and each of the other executives are doing the same thing. Um, whether or not they reach the point at banning outside attendance is uh, beyond my control nor my knowledge. Uh, but I suspect if the surge continues, and I do think the surge is going to continue for a while longer, we saw continual increase in cases right through the middle of January a year ago, which, which took in the two-week period of time after New Year's Day. Uh, I think it was January 18th, we hit the, the most recent peak, and uh, we appear to be still rising day to day between now and then. Uh, whether or not they will you know, take other action, uh, such as banning uh, attendance at these places, I don't know. Uh, that might be wise, but I'm not in a position to know. We don't have county staff eligible to go in and survey circumstances or, or to get that kind of information from the nursing homes or the hospital. So I'll leave that to the state decision makers. Okay. And the next question, which is the last question, comes from Peter Katz. He asks, what's your advice for business people regarding instituting COVID prevention? Should they shut down at this time? No, I don't think we need to shut down. I do think that uh, mask wearing is, is a valuable thing that is the least intrusive element of things. Now, there are people who don't want to wear masks. They have their philosophy for it and so forth. But a mask is a temporary uh, item. You wear it when you're in close quarters with somebody else. <laughs> if you walk into a, um, a retail establishment, putting the mask on for what amounts to uh, anywhere from 10 minutes to 45 minutes if you're grocery shopping that you might be in a store, to me does not seem like a significant uh, compromise of your freedom. Uh, and I would think that if we can provide 
masks to those businesses if they don't have available masks in their inventory, uh, that they're made available, easily available to those who come in and uh, and they're recommended to use. Now, the, um, uh, the governor's mandate uh, is uh, not being enforced in parts of the state willfully. Um, you know, we're going to try to enforce it. As I said, we're not looking for confrontation. We're looking for people to wear masks and not because we're trying to tell them anything about society. We're trying to make sure that they don't project that which would affect people. And, uh, and I think we all have to look now with the with the nature of this uh, communicable situation, things that we did uh, partially masked, we may have to go fully masked now for a period of time. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I've been out of the streets of, uh, off the streets of uh, Westchester County for the last eight days, nine days. When I go back out and I see what's out there, I get a better sense of how many people are voluntarily complying with it or not. But this is a, you know, uh, this is an agitated time. And uh, I think we have to figure out how to work through it avoid having a necessary confrontation between fellow Americans, but also understand that some minimal sacrifice for each other is essential. Do you have any more questions at this time? Very good. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you all for watching. I'm George Latimer, wishes to County Executive. Thank you, Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins. Uh, we'll both be back in, uh, in the saddle shortly. Again, I want to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas. Those who celebrate Christmas, uh, followed by the beginnings of a joyous Kwanzaa when we're together again next Monday at two o'clock. We'll give you an update on where we stand on some of these issues. Uh, it would be nice to know that um, perhaps the surge has abated, but we'll see how it all turns out. Again, have a wonderful day. Be safe.